find someone here you got something in common with, you know, someone you can talk to, and if you don't, well, there's always a little old me. <laughs> what? How long have I been here? Gee, I forgot. I've been having such a good time. I, for so long, I, I haven't even looked at the calendar. You know, one thing you'll notice after you've been here a little while, everything is sort of slow and easy. You kind of solve all your problems, all the pain and care of the outside world just sort of slither away like magic. Now, I'll tell you something. I'm gonna let you in on a little secret on how we do this. Now, it isn't easy. It takes time. Sometimes years and years. But we have worked together to construct a world of our own. Now, there are some people, wet blankets, spoil sports, who tell us it's an artificial world. Well, so what? It's real enough for us, isn't it? Am I wrong? Right. But you know, I'm talking too much. May I procure for you a little picky diminutive libation cup? What do you have? Seventy percent of American adults drink regularly, and for the most part without problems. However, within our drinking population are nine million people who have crossed over the line. Nine million for whom drinking is no longer a pleasure. Nine million who have spent too long at the fair. Who have bought themselves a ticket for a ride on an endless nightmare. Alcohol is a beverage almost as long as our tenure on Earth. The basic element, ethyl alcohol, is the same substance that gave our ancestors their first pleasurable jolt. Ethyl alcohol is a drug. It causes progressive paralysis of the central nervous system, just as an anesthetic puts us to sleep for an operation. However, as early man discovered, alcohol taken in carefully administered doses produces a pleasurable sensation, a relaxation of tensions, a mild euphoria. Socrates commented that wine moistens the soul 
lulls our griefs to sleep and wakens kindly feelings. Today, nearly 100 million Americans regularly confirm the accuracy of his observations. It makes me feel confident, and, and this, this makes me feel good. It makes me feel freer, uh, less inhibited. We have very, very few people that come in and uh, get intoxicated. Uh, families go out to restaurants for dinner, and the parents will have a drink while the children will have a Coke. And uh, it most likely is prevalent throughout the country. You know, as a businessman, I have many situations during the day that make me extremely tense, and it's, it's difficult for me to wind down when I leave the office. But if I can go to a, a place like the Man of Leisure Bar, or, or a, another tavern where I can relax and just have a cocktail, it makes me feel so much better, and it, I don't keep those anxieties in, in me. And especially around females. If they're ill at ease, a drink relaxes them, and it makes them feel like that they can converse better. They even become better looking sometimes, and I guess maybe sometimes they do. <laughs> well, this cocktail hour gives them a chance to get out and to release some of this frustration and to change their atmosphere and to possibly uh, relax a little in the course of their day's work. You know, there's nothing wrong in drinking in moderation and, and taking a couple drinks just to enjoy the, the, the surroundings that you're in is perfectly all right. You can go to the pro shop, have a drink, go out and play a round of golf, come back and have another drink. So many more people have so much more free time today than they've enjoyed in, at any other time in, in their past, and they have more money to spend on leisure time activities, and uh, having a beer is part of having a good time. Alcoholic beverages are good for the party, they make the party, and um, moderation is the tone today. Nobody goes overboard on any one thing. And there are no commonly agreed to rules governing our drinking behaviors. Americans drink for different reasons. To some, alcohol enhances a social situation. For others, it is a setting for discussing business. It may serve as a safety valve for workaday pressures. And it may serve as a sort of invisible armor for social combat. However, in many ethnic quarters where the old world social order is still preserved, where custom and ritual remain deeply rooted in family life, Drinking attitudes are surprisingly consistent. The ground rules are spelled out and absolutely clear to everyone. Many of these American subcultures enjoy alcohol as a regular part of daily living, a natural accompaniment to the evening meal, and often shared by the children. For some, it is part of the religious experience, a ceremonial ritual intertwined with powerful moral sentiments. And every child from its earliest infancy is made aware of the normal use of wine as a symbol of the joys of life. Never in our tradition has wine been regarded as an evil in itself. It is only its use in excess that is condemned. And likewise, the denial or self-denial altogether of the use of wine is also frowned upon in our tradition. As different as these American subcultures are, they share one common characteristic in their attitude towards alcohol. There are strong social controls governing its use. There is no confusion as to acceptable or unacceptable drinking behavior. Within these drinking groups, the incidence of alcoholism or excessive drinking behaviors is virtually non-existent. Moving uptown or into the suburbs, we become more and more part of that homogenous scene where drinking is quite often done for the physical and psychological changes it offers. This is no man's land. It is here that the drinker is left to choose for himself when to drink, how much to drink, and in which company to drink. And statistically, this is dangerous territory. 
The chances are one in ten that the drinker will develop an alcohol problem, one that will hurt him, his family, or society in general. Every tavern and neighborhood bar offers a drinking situation with its own unique set of rules. Here, a drinker can seek his own level, maintain a satisfying relationship, enjoy a certain prestige, and even adopt someone else's culture. distinct absence of any form of universal agreement. Because there is no national norm, there are virtually no commonly accepted social controls, nor are there commonly accepted standards of drinking behaviors against which we can measure ourselves, or measure those in our family who may drink. In fact, all forms of drinking behaviors, routines, and habits, including outright drunkenness, can be accepted by some groups somewhere at some time. Thus, the drinking American, with no standards to follow, moves through a series of drinking situations with almost chameleon-like adaptability. He may feel that it sets a bad example to drink at his own dinner table at home, but thinks nothing of tossing down three or four stiff ones at a business luncheon. Mardi Gras as a legitimate excuse to get blasted. And through all of this, whether it's pagan revelry or Lenten penitence, we seem to confuse our feelings and attitudes toward both the beneficial as well as the evil properties attributed to alcohol. Many drinkers carry the burden of ancient stigmas rooted deeply in our national consciousness. These stigmas, combined with the drinker's personality, that complex blend of strength and weakness, of fear, anxiety, and emotional need. When the American drinker approaches the watering hole and grabs the glass, he's doing far more than quenching a thirst. He may be palliating a host of interwoven, deeply ingrained problems. This in itself may not necessarily direct his path to eventual alcoholism, but without some form of nationally accepted guideline, it becomes easier and easier to slip into a harmful drinking pattern, a pattern actually encouraged by certain drinking groups. And nine million of us have already done so. We may find ourselves spending more and more time either drinking or planning to drink. While we have one glass in our hand, we're already thinking about the next one, or perhaps the one after that. We begin to plan ahead. Instead of drinking for companionship, for relaxation, to enhance a social or recreational activity, we begin to drink alone. And intensifying the problem for the vulnerable drinker is a gradual, psychological dependency and physical addiction to the drug. Eventually it shows up on the job, whether in the carpeted boardroom or on the concrete floor of the assembly line. With growing frequency, more and more time cards are not being punched. Journalists have described this loss to industry as the billion dollar hangover. Actually, it's a two billion dollar hangover. When the 70s began, American industry was losing 40 million workdays a year because of alcoholic employees. And in addition to absenteeism, there were increasing accidents and sloppy work, both attributed to the same cause. Alcohol costs the country at large a lot more than it costs industry. A total of $15 billion a year goes down the drain when you begin tallying up the carnage of the highways, the broken homes, the displaced children, the senseless fights, and the even more senseless murders. What's the problem? 
You say your husband is an alcoholic and uh, he was attempting suicide this morning. He's removed to Bellevue Hospital. He's now escaped and he's back at the residence. All right. Six, six, excited, John. Many of the social problems, much of the physical and mental destruction caused by excessive drinkers could have been averted by early intervention. But the ancient stigmas are still with us. Alcoholism is still a dirty household word. Rather than identify ourselves or members of our family at an early stage when therapy is relatively easy, we cloak our illness in a variety of masks, of alibis, of logical explanations. We seek to preserve the image, the mantle of respectability, our adherence to the Protestant ethic. And for the American middle class, it is not too difficult to demonstrate, even on a daily basis, that we are still in control. We managed to get our grip on Monday, and with superhuman effort, make it until the first socially acceptable drink at noontime. We try to maintain the normal family pattern. We always have one indispensable smoke screen working for us. The classic alcoholic, the soup kitchen, skid row derelict. After all, we don't look like him. We're well dressed, clean shaven, and knocking down an impressive salary. The only problem with this rationale is that the skid row derelict comprises a very small three to five percent of the alcoholic population. He is the tip of the iceberg. The other 95% of the iceberg is made up of people pretty much like ourselves, people who spend an undue amount of energy convincing everyone around them that they don't have a drinking problem. This means going to work, no matter how badly we feel. This is particularly true among the upper middle class. It helps lessen the sense of guilt. And as we find ourselves carrying out our theatrical deception, we often find that we're protected in a variety of ways by our spouses, our peers, our fellow workers, all the significant others in our lives. After all, it is difficult to confront an alcoholic person. It's much easier to go along with the deception. ourselves slowly, almost imperceptibly, moving from one drinking group to another. We're always in search of the companions who will tolerate our ever-increasing excesses. And then finally, the search ends. The ride is over. The carousel goes on without us. The real tragedy in the drinker's life is that little is done for him until he has finally lost all self-control, until he is a late-stage chronic alcoholic, and his behaviors can no longer be covered up or ignored by friends, employers, or family. But more often than not, his first exposure to therapy and rehabilitation is a shock awakening in either a drunk tank or a detoxification ward. Our society has dealt with the public drunk in this manner ever since its founding. The fault does not lie with the law, it rests squarely with the community, which having failed to develop alternate methods of prevention, satisfies itself by sweeping the problem under the rug where no one will see it. Your name is uh, Harold P. Shortridge. You're 48 years old. How long have you had an alcohol problem? A 
was a diplomat of service. And how long ago was that? 1945, I believe. And how much have you been drinking each day during this past month? Right at the day and night. How much would you consume in a 24-hour period? Loads. Five or six pints of that wine. How much Sterno did you drink? Me and this guy make six cans just to even though recent years have seen the beginnings of a more enlightened view toward treating the alcoholic person in the courtroom, the treatment facilities are not getting to him soon enough. By the time he is admitted to some form of therapy, much damage has already taken place. Damage to himself and to those around him. I was living in Virginia. I used to work with a guy and all he drank sternal. And the treatment? Where it exists at all is often narrow and segmented. At best, it is a rather inflexible program in which the patient is expected to adapt to the system. Years to both. Often, programs are centered around what is known as didactic therapy. We don't take that first drink. One of the most important things is to accept the fact that you've had it. The drinker reached this advanced state Alcoholic, of dependency no because of many complex of interwoven problems relating to his own personality, as well as the people and situations in his life. The course is over. Without early intervention, the process of restoration Spend is unnecessarily complicated. People who have the same problem you have, and I'm talking about AA. This is the finest organization in the world to help people with a problem with a disease that we have. There are people who understand, because they know they've gone through it, and we can help each other. Many specialists representing a variety of disciplines may have to work with the patient for a long time, applying generous doses of kindness and understanding if he is to face his world once again without chemical reinforcement. And no program, no matter how costly and how elaborate, is going to work if it does not respond to the specific needs of the person afflicted. The system must tailor its therapy to the individual. Successful programs often involve the family in the treatment approach. The seeds of the patient's problem may be buried deeply in a complex set of family relationships. Well, we still don't get along the way we should, I don't believe, uh, as a family, right? Uh, the same problems basically are still there. We had a pretty fairly good Christmas and New Year's, but uh, I still find myself getting uptight, hollering, and uh, I think a little bit less than what it used to be, though, isn't it? A lot less. Thank you. But it's still there. The problems aren't gone, but I can remember it a lot less. He's able to cope with it better now, but I think the problem exists within us, not just entirely with him. We've discovered a great many therapeutic techniques, ranging from psychodramas to family sensitivity sessions, but we don't know yet what works for what kind of people. And this should not be surprising, for we have only recently accepted alcoholism as an illness. And we're still in the process of learning how to treat the casualties. What is even more important than treatment is to prevent the casualties. Prevention begins with an unbiased discussion of the problem from every community forum. There is a growing concern amongst our people that we get off of the ancient conflict between the wets and the dries. We begin a new attitude, a new approach towards the community in dealing with what is generally called the alcohol problem. And we're beginning to see that this is a problem not just of morality, it isn't just a problem of medicine, of mental health, it's a problem of the entire community in which many people are concerned. While alcoholic education is required by law, it is usually viewed as an opportunity for a temperance lecture. Children are perceptive, even at kindergarten age. Why not give them the knowledge of the drug and what its beneficial as well as harmful effects can be? And education should not stop in the classroom. Adult education, particularly among the traditional helping agencies, can help focus a clearer understanding if the child of the problem. Comes to school and says mommy is sick on Monday and Tuesday. 
and you get this repeatedly, you'd better start wondering whether or not that the mother of this child might not be an alcoholic. And finally, how about you? As a host, do you help your guests towards safer and saner drinking habits? Do you serve drinks or do you forcibly push them? Do you respect the right of those who prefer to drink something else, something non-alcoholic? And do you assume full responsibility for anyone who had had too much of your booze? most importance. It's not how much or how little we decide to drink or where or when. It's really how clearly we define what is acceptable to us as a 20th century society. By the same coin, what is not acceptable. Drinking in itself is an individual choice. However, the level of responsibility we expect to see exercised is not. It is society's choice. The use of alcohol is as old as man's need to alter reality. Every age has seen its benefits as well as the harm that it can do. Alcohol in itself is not evil. Its use is not immoral. For 30,000 years, it has offered to man a degree of physical and psychological comfort, a sense of well-being. It has equally been available as a source for gradual psychological dependency and physical addiction. Alcohol is a drug. As we approach any drug, we must likewise view alcohol with a certain understanding and appreciation, a realistic appraisal of the chemical substance. From this understanding comes the basis to make sound decisions as to its use. It is the challenge of this age with its unique stresses and psychological pitfalls to thoroughly understand the potential of alcohol for good as well as bad. Through research and education, each of us, without emotionalism, can choose to abstain or indulge. And in either event, to pursue our choice within a framework beneficial to ourselves and to our community.